Good. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to be here to acknowledge our God. Uh, there is a sheet, Spanish speakers, Espanol. There's a sheet. Hopefully, that is of some help. And uh, from the youngest to the oldest, it's good to be here. Uh, we have just sung, I live to serve your majesty. Well, that's really what we're going to think about as we come into the word of God in Luke chapter 16 right now. We're going to think about living so as to serve our mighty God. The title I've got for the message is Living Life in the Vertical. Living Life in the Vertical. Living life with reference to God. We live amongst people, the majority in our schools, in our communities, do not live to serve God. But this morning, we are going to be reordering our ways so as we make sure that we live life in the vertical. Majority of people around us are just living life in the horizontal. And in the end, that's a fake life. The real life is the life that's lived in the vertical with God's life coming in and through us. So how do you live? How do you live? Is it a shock that somebody is saying to you this morning we got to think about God is that a, a shock to you or is that something that is really driving you well if you're a true Christian uh, this should be your desire to live life in the vertical the horizontal life of course is occupied just with this world the pleasures of this world keeping going in this world getting the approval of this world and the people around us. The vertical life is driven by an awareness of God, an awareness that he is the one who is sovereign Lord, king over all. And if you live your life just in the horizontal, Children, everybody, if you live your life just in your in the horizontal, it is a mess now and forevermore. The vertical life, connecting with God, referring to God, engaging with God is the real life. It's the life which is full of life and purpose now. And forevermore. So we're coming specifically this morning to Luke and chapter 16 and verses 14 through to 18. We're coming to chapter 16 of Luke, verses 14 to 18. And in coming to this passage, we are in many ways coming to the heart of discipleship from chapter 9 verse 51 we had it established that the lord jesus is going to glory through jerusalem and we've been seeing the pattern from there about the issues that the followers of the lord jesus would have in their lives as they follow the lord jesus as the one who went to the cross and then on to glory what is to be seen in our lives what do true disciples have in their lives and as we come to this passage this morning, I suggest we come to a very central issue, a very prominent, a very, um, a very important as regards to determining whether we are true disciples or not. The question really focuses on this. Who dominates you? Who dominates you? You dominated by God. Were you dominated by this 
well. Verse 13, we've had the Lord Jesus saying, notice he's been speaking to his disciples. Verse 1, it says he said to his disciples, <coughs> he says in verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot be devoted to both God and possessions. The things of this world and God cannot be sharing lordship in your life. We know that from everyday affairs, don't we? Okay. Even as regards to football players, they have to be on to one club, don't they? They can't be playing for one club here and then another club there. And it, it's, it's one allegiance that makes things work. Similarly with our job situations. One allegiance determines the character of our lives. You're going to either, you cannot serve God and money. The teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. But then verse 13, we see, uh, verse 14 rather, we see the Pharisees. They've been listening in, it seems. The Lord Jesus speaking to his disciples, verse 1, the Pharisees are listening in. The Pharisees are the religious, uh, religious people uh, showing a great, uh, great desire, great uh, concern for doing what pleases God. But that is really a cover for the fact that they aren't really those who are set on pleasing God. Verse 14 says, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. They turned their nose up at the Lord Jesus and said, no, no, no. We, we are the ones who actually can carry it off. We can love God and love money. They are, it says straightforwardly there, lovers of money, lovers of the things of this world, lovers of possessions for they also made this show of loving god in fact in the in the world at that time the pharisees were the ones who made a great show of doing things for god trying to follow all the rules they were really big quite impressive but in their hearts they were those who were lovers of money you see it's our hearts that really reveal where we truly are but we'll just stop and challenge ourselves because we can be those of us who come to church can be very easily fitting into the pharisees can we we can actually be doing the things that make a show coming to church doing religious things, but actually our hearts are just loving the things of this world. May it not be so. May it not be so. So let's come to our two main points this morning. Two main points. We're going to think, first of all, of the horizontal life. The horizontal life. You're going to think about life lived on the horizontal. This, in a sense, is the fake life, the life that makes a show of being life, but in the end is not true life because it is not connected to God. So let's look in verses 14 to 15. And we're looking here at these Pharisees. These are the people who are actually living life in the horizontal they make a show of being for god but actually what they are are people who are living for this world and so the lord jesus says to them in verse 15 you are those who justify yourselves before men 
but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. They, these Pharisees, who are examples of the people living the horizontal life, notwithstanding their religion, these people want to be seen to be right before men. That's the idea of justify. They want to be seen in the right place, doing the right thing, so as everybody is impressed. In the end, when you strip away everything, they are a people who are living life in the horizontal. They're alive. Their, people, their, their motivation is to be seen to be those who are doing the right stuff. And they want everybody to say, yeah, they're the, they're the real guys. They're the real guys who are really living it. Yeah? They've got their, they're, they're, they're seen to be the people who've achieved. They're seen to be the people who've got all of the stuff that, that, that makes for life in this world, a decent house, a decent status, and they're just living for these things. They are a people who want to be proving themselves to be right in the sight of men. That is their motivation. But God knows your hearts. So whose viewpoint matters this morning? The fact that everybody says around you, yeah, I think he's doing decent. Ha, I, I wish I could be like that. I wish we could be like the Pharisees. They're the people who are making it. They're the people who have got all of the right stuff going in their lives. But God knows your hearts. There's nothing more significant for us to hear this morning than that statement. God knows your heart. Who knows me? God. Who knows you? God. Who knows everything about you? God, you don't know everything about you, but God knows everything about you. And I certainly don't know everything about you, but God knows everything about you and he knows the very center. He knows what makes you tick. He knows whether you're living for the horizontal, the approval of this world, or whether you are living for the vertical. He knows whether you're living for the right profile on social media. He knows whether you're living to get the appropriate response, whether you're on Facebook or on Instagram or wherever. He knows that you're just interested in your image. So we're examining ourselves. Are we those who are living just to be proven right before men? Just want the right friends. You know what it can be like in, in, in amongst children, but amidst society generally. You, you, you're maneuvering so that you've got the right friends. And if you've got the right friends, that they can make the right noises for you and you exclude other people and life is just one pursuit of trying to make things right for yourself and when you've got the right property and when you've got the right possessions or when you've got the right job or when you've got the the, the right status and then everybody says well done oh that's that's the way we we oh yes and, and you've got the says I know your hearts that's seeking for this world and it does not it does not does not 
lead to satisfaction. It's a fake. And then the Lord comes big against, comes big against it. You're dominated by this work. And the Lord said, just wanting to expose it to the Pharisees, he says to them, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. It's as if he's saying, all your position, all your possessions, all your pats on the back from everybody, all of your followers on Twitter, all of your friends on Facebook, and you think you've made it because you've got such a profile in different places. Oh, God says that. He doesn't just say, I don't like that. It's as if he comes and, well, he does say, doesn't he? It's an abomination. A whole world mindset that focuses on myself being the center of everything. The Lord says that's an abomination. It's an abomination just to be living in this world so as you can be seen to be right by this world. Dominated by worldly thinking, dominated by having all the right holidays and all the right pleasures and all of the things that you deserve. People will say when you've got the oh, yes, that's life. That's life. They're really living. In many ways, society is those who are seeking to display that they've made it, and those seeking to aspire to making it as they look at those who've made it as the people they want to be. And that's being dominated by this world, dominated by the thinking of time and of sense and the things around us. It's an abomination. It's an abomination in the sight of God. Who do you want to be viewing your life? When you go out into the week, continually told that the view of this world and the view of people around us is what matters. But God is saying to us, no, it is my view that matters. It is my view. So think about your decision-making this week. Think about your decision making. You know what you've got to think about from the smallest of issues. Perhaps it's even choosing friends this week. Perhaps it's choosing how you're going to deal with a situation. Now, am I going to deal with this situation just to maximize how people are going to see me positively? Or am I going to say, no, I just want to please God. I just want to please the law. So that is the fake life. That is the horizontal life. That is the life lived for this world. That is the life dominated by this world. My second point this morning, I want to come to the true way, the true stuff, the life to be lived in the Vertical, the light to be dominated by God. <coughs> so we come then to verses 16 to 18. I want to be uh, making us aware, first of all, that God rules through his word. God, as it were, brings forth the showing of himself through his word. We're aware of who God is through his word. It's not me imagining certain things or doing an online search to find out 
what such and such a person thinks about God. It is the word of God reveals God. So to be dominated by God is to be dominated by his word. You may feel uncomfortable with this domination word, but if you go back to verse 13, they really, the essence is that you're either dominated by God or dominated by the things of this world. But there's, there's, there's not an option. You're dominated by one or the other. And the call, I believe, and the heart of the discipleship is taking up this realization that we need to be dominated by God and dominated by his word. So let's look at verse 16 and we'll see what, uh, how this unfolds here. So the law and the prophets were until John. So the law and the prophets, what is that? That's the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Those are the writings of God. That's the true revelation of God. That's the word of God that shows who God is. That was until John, John the Baptist. Now things changed with John the Baptist. These kind of transition things. John the Baptist comes along and say, hey, everything is now fulfilled. Everything is about to be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He would say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we see then stated in, uh, in verse 16, since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. Good news that the king has arrived, a new regime is being established. This regime is the regime in Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the fulfillment. So we would go to Matthew chapter 6 and verses 17 to 20 to realize something more. You can turn to that passage a little bit earlier in your Bible if you want to, or simply listen to what I say here concerning what the Lord Jesus says about his position. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. But truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Particularly then verse 17 in that passage, I want us to be aware of that the Lord Jesus has come to fulfill everything. He is the one who, has, who is the completion of all that is come before. I want us to think then now about a building. I just want us to get into our minds what all this means. You've got a building. You've got a building project uh, that... Uh, Many building projects going on in Felton at the moment. We got a building project. So what's the thing that you do to start a building project? What's the thing that you do? You get all the plans together, don't you? You get all the plans together. And those plans set the arrangements for the building that you want to build. An architect will do the plans and they are the basis for which on which the building will be built. And so you start to build the building and you realize, well, actually, this is a complete mess. This is completely useless. Uh, this just won't work. And so you just finish the project and say, well, we're not going to move forward with this. And so the whole project is brought to an end 
And so those plans, what are you going to do with them? Well, you may as well just chuck them away, can't you? you they're, they're of no use because the project hasn't happened. Those plans didn't come to anything. So throw the, the plans are finished, basically. The plans are of no value. But alternatively, as it should be, you get a building and everything goes forward and you get your nice new building all finished. And what are you going to do with the plans then? What are you going to do with the plans that you had or that gave you the design of the building? Are you going to keep them? Because those plans are essential for showing you how this building has been built. What is the basic structure of the building and for dealing with things along the way, you will be wanting to know perhaps how some of the brickwork has been done or the heating system or the, pl or the plumbing and you'll need those plans. You see, in that instance, the plans have led to a fulfillment. The building is the fulfillment of the plans, but you must keep the plans uh, because they are so important for making sure you know how that building can go forward. Now, what am I saying here? I'm saying here that the law and the prophets are the plans. <coughs> the law and the prophets are the declaration of how things are to be in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the place where God reigns. But now all is fulfilled. Jesus has come. Jesus has not finished the law and the prophets. Jesus has fulfilled the law and the prophets. He has brought those plans to a full and final conclusion. He has fulfilled the sacrificial system. He has shown how sinners need to be saved. And he has come and brought salvation. Everything that was opened up through the law and the prophets about our need of salvation is now seen to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the one who has come to make salvation, to bring in this new kingdom where God can reign over his people. Now, is God reigning over you? Is God reigning over you? This kingdom is a God domination kingdom. It is a God ruling over us kingdom, and it comes in Jesus Christ. And it's the kingdom of fulfillment of God's purposes, and it's the kingdom of fulfillment for us. But we enter in to what God has done in Christ. And so it says here, people get it. So what are people doing in verse 16? What are they doing? They're saying, we're going for it. We're going for it. We might say the godly Jews who saw what the law and prophets were talking about, they see it fulfilled in Jesus. You see, the Messiah has come. We're going for it. We're getting in there. They're using all their energy. They're pressing into it. They've got, they're saying, we, we, we're not going to stay out. We want God to dominate us. We want God over us. That's the wise response this morning. If you choose the way to have your, the world over you, you're living the fake life, the miserable life, the horizontal. But the call is to have God dominating. It's his word has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God to dominate. So get in there, press in, make sure you're there. You're not saved this morning. Make sure you're in. Make sure that you are one of those who is under God's reign and rule through Jesus Christ. What's happened to the word of God? What's happened to the word of God? What's happened to it? Is the word of God finished? The word of God is fulfilled. The word of God stands. The word of God is of more 
eternal value and a more eternal substance than heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, verse 17. Not one jot of the law will become void. Easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one dot of the law to become void. The law of God, the word of God stands. The word of God reveals God. The word of God takes us to the kingdom of God fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The word of God is the way that God dominates his people dominates them, dare I say, into his kingdom and dominates them in his kingdom. And that domination is the domination of release into life because we're living life in the vertical because God is coming and this word cannot be taken away or destroyed. And the wise things to do is to say, I want that. <laughs> I want that. I want that word. I don't want to be dominated by me, and I don't want to be dominated by this world. I want to be dominated by God through his word and released into life. His word is a light, a lamp. Go and read Psalm 119 to show you how great is the word of the Lord. So we're seeing here then that the word of the Lord stands. Oh, yes. Remember then the law and the prophets stand. Christians don't forget to be studying the Old Testament and to be studying the Old Testament to realize that it is the plan that are fulfilled in Jesus. That's what it's about. As somebody has said is, why have we got all this material in the Old Testament? And we, and we have got it to prepare us for Jesus. <laughs> That's why you've got it. To prepare us for the Lord Jesus. And he's come. But then go back and see how it all works out and be thrilled with the plan of God. And be excited. This is what God is doing. Stand and stand. Well, then you come to verse 18. And you think, what's that there for? It almost just appears from nowhere. What's that about? We've been talking about this issue, about living for this world, about the word of God. And then he comes to verse 18, and the Lord does, and he says, well, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Why is that? Why is that? I think... I'm going to put it to you. It's all about this issue of being dominated by the word of God. And specifically, it refers to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, how did they respond to the word of God? We've been thinking about what it is. The Pharisees were the people who seemed to be in the right, but actually were completely in the wrong. How did they handle the word of God? Basically, they handled the word of God in a manner of how can we get around it for our own personal convenience? How can we get around it for our own personal benefit? So they come to the issue of divorce and remarriage. And they would come, some of them would come to the conclusion that, yeah, how do we get out of this marriage? Yeah, I, I, I know there's this, these statements about uh, marriage and, uh, uh, and divorce and, and stuff, but I want to get out of it. So they go do some maneuvering and they would work it all out and they would come to a conclusion and they would say, well, it got to the degree to which some would even say, if my wife burnt the dinner, that, that's grounds. She can go. I'm free. Even if she just burnt the dinner, they would say, I'm free. I can divorce her. I'm free. See, they weren't dominated by the word of God. They were just continually seeing the word of God and saying, well, how can we get around it? 
How can we maneuver ourselves? You see, it's a worldly spirit, isn't it? It, it, in a sense, it presents itself as you see, as having the word of God and, and the importance that you keep the, the, uh, of the word of had God has for marriage and the issues of divorce and, and remarriage. But they were they just manipulated Deuteronomy 24 for their own advantage so that they can get out of marriage when they wanted to. They weren't dominated by the word of God. You see, I think that's the meaning of verse 18. And we're going to have a full study tonight, interestingly, on divorce and remarriage. So come tonight, a quarter past five, we're going to have an hour looking at this issue. And I'm not going to go into, well, into this issue. But the big issue from verse 18 for of ourselves is whether we take the word of God and are dominated by it. We, we as it were, it's, it's something like this. We, 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 we set our parameters and we say, that's the word of God. Like we take a command, you cannot, you shall not commit adultery. And we stand under it and say, yes. And we'll work out all that that means, even the teaching of the Lord, that your heart lusting after a, man, a woman, that can be adultery. And we feel the weight of it. And we're right under it, you see. We're dominated by it because we want to be dominated by God, that's the whole thing here. And we're not people. You see, we're surrounded by people, even in the church, who, who basically say, well, that's the word of God. Ah, but. We, we, we're just getting outside of it, and we're going around it, and we're there, oh, yes, we can get around it, you know. But that was how it was done in those days, you know. Oh, uh, and you see it particularly with the issues that face us in the uh, in the church and in the world today with regard to the issues of sexuality and with, re with, with regard to the issues of gender. Uh, there's all kinds of things people do to try and get around the word of God. Uh, but we stand dominated by the word of God. We are not to be a people who come to the word of God and say, oh, yes, I understand that's what it says, but I'm going to get around it. Okay? We, we are people who receive the word of God as the word of God. Now, don't, don't, please get me right. We're, we're not, it doesn't, doesn't mean to say that we, we're, we're, we're a, a properly examining the word. We are to be properly examining the word properly understanding what it means that's that's essential but the important thing is that we receive the word as the word because we're a people who want to be dominated by god you understand what i'm trying to drive into this morning that to be dominated by god is life and to be dominated by god is to be dominated by his word the word has brought forth the fulfillment of everything in Jesus Christ. The word of God stands and the word of God is the way of life. And don't be like the Pharisees who are manipulators to try and get around the word. Be those who stand under the word. And then when you fail by the word, don't be those who say, well, I, 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 you, you don't know what circumstances I was in that led me to do this and that. No, just feel and repent. Repent. God receives sinners. Repent and return to the law. And know that refreshing return. So as we come to conclusion, I just want us to go away thoughtful about our motivations. Are we living for this world? Are we dominated by this world? Or are we dominated by God? Are we dominated by the approval of people? Or are we dominated by the approval of God? Are we living life in the vertical or living life in the horizontal? Are we living the fake life? of this world which presents as so genuine but in the end is fake are we living the real life which is god's life coming into our lives through jesus christ so go and be dominated by god and you will be better
so we're going to sing a final song which sort of relishes this it's, it's a kind of hymn that's going to just going to relish the whole book of, of being dominated by god and it says king of your what well, a king of my life i crown you